Hi, everybody. Uh, I would like to start by thanking Rosa Luxemburg for hosting this um, very important, to my opinion, initiative, and also thanking the, the team of the Greek, um, uh, the Greek team that uh, thought of this initiative. I cannot think of a more uh, critical issue and perhaps a more pressing issue in the context uh, of the Greek political and social conjuncture. So I'm really thankful for the opportunity to share with you um, some considerations. And this is indeed what I'm going to do, just share with you some considerations that have to do with um, um, the match or the mismatch between um, uh, the ideals uh, of the green, the ideas of the green left society, the ideas of the green left social movements on the one hand, to which I refer to, what I'm going to say is committed to, to, the green left, to a green left future. On the one hand, this, and then on the other hand, what um, scholars call oil-led development societies, countries. Uh, I don't have an argument, or perhaps if I do it, I want to save it for later in the day, in the session where I will present my own uh, proposal for an alternative. Here in this session, I will focus on considerations, as I, said, as I already said, considerations on what it means to be an oil-led development country. As the Greek of us know very well, and I'm sure um, colleagues from abroad do know that, um, we live uh, in the middle of, a, of an unprecedented crisis for a Western country, especially for the post-World War II period. And um, we have already lived with, uh, uh, with several proposals that were seeking an exit to the crisis to, to energy policies. Uh, as you all know, there was a huge uh, mega project proposed focused on exportation of wind power from Greece to, to Germany, for that matter, and other northern European countries. That is already out, uh, out of the picture. And we are now living with something that seems even greater, in scale at least, which is um, the, a scenario that, uh, that, uh, that invests on the idea that the several areas in Greece are full with oil, oil to be um, uh, extracted, and oil to help the Greeks uh, um, escape the crisis, if not to become rich for many years to come. So what I'm going to say is, of course, politically charged. Uh, the first point about oil led, uh, well, I'm sorry, my source for the consideration for the points that I'm going to make, I thought instead of presenting personal points, to refer to some standard literature. And for me, a standard literature, I found some standard reference in uh, one of the most famous ongoing, actively ongoing used encyclopedias of energy. There is an encyclopedia of energy, that's the name of it. And most of what I'm going to say, with the exception of one point, one consideration, the final one, is based on, uh, on, uh, on an article, on a piece written there by a Stanford professor. The name of the professor is Terry Lynn Carroll. The first point that uh, Professor Carl makes is that um, there is a paradox of plenty. That's how this is usually called in the literature. Or a resource cares, η κατάρα του να έχεις πηγές, έτσι, το παράδοξο των πολλών. The scholarship agrees that uh, we have something that's extremely paradoxical. Most of the countries, with the exception of very few, if not one, um, that, uh, that are very rich in oil resources are not doing very well. They are either very poor countries or countries that, um, that are suffering from authoritarian regimes, or both. Um, and this is a paradox that needs to be explained. In their opinion, um, in the opinion of the scholars who make this observation, there are several points that have to be made. The first point is that um, it's called the Dutch disease, because they observed it in the Netherlands first. That the overdevelopment of the oil sector, which is unavoidable when you invest on in oil resources, can hurt decisively the other sectors. Uh, I'm going to mention just one example. It can hurt in the Greek case decisively. It can, it can actually, it can represent a fatal blow to the development of wind energy uh, forever, for, for critical decades to come. This happens everywhere in oil-led development countries. The second, economies that depend on oil-led development are very susceptible to, 
to, to very sharp fluctuations in the economy, to boom and best cycles, unlike other economies. This is very important because it means that they cannot have a long-term planning as other countries do, as other Western countries do. The third point, yes, the third point concerns um, uh, the fact that uh, there are very weak linkage, linkages in countries with oil-led development. There are very weak linkages between uh, the technology, the high tech used in the oil industry and the rest of the economy. You can see this in Saudi Arabia, for example. There, in other words, there is no diffusion of technology throughout society. There is no adaptation, no localization. There is a concentration. The results are terrible. For, for the country as a whole and its technological basis. Uh, fourth and related point, oil becomes uh, so crucial that all the export sex sector is based, is overwhelmingly based on oil. And this can be, be a terrible problem. The second unit of issues raised by scholars who, who focus on the study of oil-led development countries has to do with the poverty. Uh, so these states are not usually Western social welfare states. The educational statistics are terrible. We have very specific studies that show that for every rise, uh, for every percentage rise in the de dependence on oil, there is an equal uh, fall, drop in the quality of education for, for, the, for the poorest people. And this is terrible. I'm not going to say more on this. I will focus more on the technical uh, points. So I'll go to the third one. There are changes in the social structure, huge changes in the state. The state, as we know from the work of Pulajas and others, uh, is not just an instrument. It develops, it adjusts to the economic priorities of, of capitalist societies. What scholars have found is that in oil related economies, the state tends to become uh, unable to reform. Uh, it, it cannot, it cannot, uh, uh, it, it tends to, to be unable to, to deal with bureaucracy pro, uh, problems. It tends to be unable to institute crucial reforms. And it's usually a, a honeypot. Various social interests try to take over the state because by taking over the state, um, they can completely take over uh, authority in this society. In terms of the social classes, uh, the middle class is usually destroyed because that goes back to the point I was mentioning earlier about the, the concentration of all the power and all the technology in one area, in one sector. One very interesting point in the literature has to do with the culture of oil. It's a related point, but, it, but it's worth mentioning it uh, and focusing on it. Journalists, uh, and not only journalists, uh, people like uh, novelists, for example, and writers have observed that in societies where the culture of oil dominates, a world of illusion prevails, uh, where everybody thinks that wealth is something that's very easy to, to obtain without effort. The consequences can be terrible, and we see this very well in Arabic societies. Yes. This rentier state, το κράτος που βασίζεται στο, 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 στο ενίκιο, έτσι, στο ότι έχει τα, τα πετρέλαια, this rentier state um, also destroys the balance between taxation and representation, which is the backbone of Western democracy, with all the evils but all the good things that come with Western democracy. Because there is no, there is no need for the state to collect to, for the state and the society as a whole to be concerned about what's a fair taxation system because there is oil and oil will take care of everything and that destroys the ability of the state uh, to depend its form and its representation to depend on the interest of the people, of the middle class and the other social classes. Uh, corruption, I don't need to say much about it. It relates to what I was saying before about the state becoming a honey pot. One very key point for me is uh, the concentration of the oil development societies to what sociologists of technology call mega projects. Instead of looking at the society of the whole, what are the technological needs of the society? What do we need in schools? What do we need in hospitals? What do we need everywhere? How can we support uh, agriculture for, uh, for uh, biological development? 
everything goes to some centers of authority that care about mega projects, building huge roads that nobody perhaps needs, uh, investing on Olympic infrastructures that will be good for 15 years, will absorb tons of money. And that comes with immense corruption. And you can imagine what this could mean in a country like Greece. All the points that I have made so far, and, and a couple more that I will be made in the next two minutes that I have uh, uh, that I have at my availability, one minute. Uh, think of them in the context of Greece. Uh, my, my working hypothesis, hypothesis would be uh, what I already present you is tailored for a country that is ridden by a crisis. It's ready to accept a situation like this. My final point. Now I will come closer to my own expertise, which is not accepting the ideology that technology is neutral. Uh, that there is nothing bad about oil as a fuel, and there is nothing bad about technology that comes with oil development. It's, it's neutral. If you are good, if it's the left, if it's the green that controls it, then it's fine. If it's the right or the ultra-right or the bad corporation, then it's fine. I disagree with that. I think that technology is uh, internally, it has a bended uh, determinations. If we look at the whole chain from the extraction technology to the technology of, of refining to the technology of exporting, it, it comes with huge dependencies. Uh, dependencies that, as I said before, are, in, are embedded in the materialities of the technical configurations. Uh, very simply, to have uh, extraction for a country like Greece, for example, to develop uh, towards the direction of extraction, uh, there will be tons of high tech that will come from abroad with very little ability to be controlled locally by the left or the green. Um, I will conclude with this by adding that, in my opinion, we very quickly need a study within a very limited time framework, one month, two months, to be conducted not only by chemical engineers, not only by engineers in general or geologists, where several disciplines need to be combined. The issue in Greece has so far been presented as an issue of geopolitics first. Will it be possible for Greece to exploit the zones that may have oil? And second, it has been presented as an issue of uh, validity and reliability of, of uh, tests to see if there is indeed oil. In my opinion, the problem is much more complex. I already tried to say some things in, the, in, in a different direction, that it has to do with, with the technology involved and a whole set of consideration and dependencies. So for us, as a social movement, as a political party that refers to the left and the Greek uh, and the green, uh, we need very quickly an interdisciplinary team that will consist, of course, of engineers and political scientists, but also of sociologists, and all kind of, uh, uh, with all kind of input from, from the various movements, anthropologists, in order to have a more holistic perspective. Thank you very much.